Greetings, and thank you for joining me for this talk. Why the attacks on Dixie concern us all. No matter where you live in the world, no matter what your race is, and no matter what your religion is, the ongoing cultural genocide being perpetrated by the United States federal government against the southern states in the US concerns us all. Because the cultural genocide in the southern states, or Dixie, or as the area was once officially known as, the Confederate States of America, is one of the longest continuing acts of cultural genocide in history. Indeed, the southern states were the first victims in history of the US federal government, and it is in Dixie where the US federal government first began perpetrating cultural genocide, a practice which Washington has since carried out in many other parts of the world, such as in present day Europe, in order to turn populations into mindless and soulless slaves who will comply with Washington's agenda. In short, the US federal government honed its skills in cultural genocide in Dixie. So, to fully understand Washington's practice of cultural genocide, which is causing great levels of anarchy, lawlessness, and pain and suffering for millions of people in the world, especially in the Western world today, it is essential to know and comprehend the history of this practice, a practice which has been in existence since 1861. Without further ado, let us examine the case of Dixie. The war between the Northern States and the Southern States from 1861 to 1865 is widely and wrongly known in the world as the American Civil War. Truth be told, that war was actually the War for Southern Independence. Why? Because in 1861, the Southern states legally seceded from the Union in accordance with the original American Constitution of the Founding Fathers. Please be aware that today's American Constitution has been distorted by the US federal government to suit its agenda. In essence, the South had every legal right, as laid out in the original American Constitution, to leave the Union. Accordingly, the war which followed Southern secession from 1861 to 1865 can in no way be categorized as a civil war because there was no war on the territory of the United States of America because the Southern states legally seceded from the Union and in doing so, legally established a new country for themselves the Confederate States of America. In essence, there was no American Civil War because the South was no longer part of the United States of America. Rather, the war was between the United States of America and the Confederate States of America, two separate countries. The next fallacy to address is the reason for the war of 1861 to 1865. The war was not fought over slavery, as is aggressively asserted by the US federal government. Instead, the war revolved around states' rights and cultural identity. For many years leading up to the outbreak of the war, New England had been appropriating influence and power for itself in the Union and at the expense of other states in the Union, which was a severe violation of the Founding Fathers' Constitution. Having gathered considerable influence and power for itself, New England began wielding this in Washington, so much so that by 1861, a large, powerful and domineering federal government had taken shape in Washington, something which, again, was a severe violation of the Constitution of the Founding Fathers. 
having subverted the Union and remodeled it to suit its own aspirations, New England demanded that all of the other states in the Union bow down to its dictates. It was now that the Southern states, which had stayed true to the Union of the Founding Fathers, decided to act. People must be aware that the original Union, that of the Founding Fathers, was a loose one, in which states' rights were sacrosanct, and in which the emergence and existence of a large, powerful, and, dom and domineering federal government in Washington was absolutely prohibited. With that, the Southern states, citing the violation of states' rights by New England, legally seceded from the Union. As the great Jefferson Davis said in his last speech in Washington before he departed for Virginia, where he would shortly become president of the Confederate States of America, we leave not out of choice, but out of necessity. Now, whilst the violation of states' rights was fundamental in the South's decision to leave the Union, preservation of cultural identity was also paramount in the decision taken by the South to secede. I do not intend to go into detail here concerning this matter, but in short, the cultural identity of New England was very distinct to that of the cultural identity of the South. Whilst New England's cultural identity, brought to the region by Puritans from Norfolk in England, rested on the messianic view of itself, or messianic delusion, that it was superior to all others and was the savior of the world and thereby the guardian of the world, together with New England's money-oriented and materialistic mindset, the identity of the southern states can be described in three words, God and culture. Thus, because New England demanded that the South submit to New England's cultural identity, the southern states cited defense of their cultural identity and the threat to this from New England as also being at the heart of their decision to depart from the Union. The lie conceived and put out by the US federal government that the war from 1861 to 1865 was about abolishing slavery is deception at its most deceptive and stupidity at its most stupid. Again, I do not intend to venture into detail here concerning this matter, but suffice to say, the argument that the war was about slavery is easy to refute. So, for instance, by 1861, a mere 7% of the population of the southern states were slaveholders. Hence, 93% of southerners did not own slaves. Furthermore, there were more free blacks in the southern states compared to in the northern states. Approximately 275,000 blacks were free in the South. In addition to that, approximately 3,000 free blacks in the South owned approximately 12,000 black slaves. Also, during the War of 1861 to 1865, nearly 300,000 Southerners died. Now, are we seriously going to believe that 300,000 people gave their lives in defense of slavery? The argument is both idiotic and risible. Only an ignorant, gullible fool would believe such crude propaganda. No, 300,000 Southerners made the ultimate sacrifice for a cause which was dear to their hearts.
namely states' rights and cultural identity. Turning now to the war itself, the US federal government, led by Abraham Lincoln, a repugnant and tyrannical opportunist who had no moral compunction in using violence to safeguard and expand his power base, ordered the US Army to invade and destroy the Confederate States of America, which it duly did in 1861. The reason for the invasion was that New England wanted to enslave the South and thereby maximize federal power. The outcome of the war is known, but I will say this. The war proved that an, ind that an industry based country will almost always, if not always, defeat an agrarian based country in war. Though it should be said that the Confederate States of America had its chance to defeat the United States of America early on in the war. And that also, soldier for soldier, the Confederate was superior to his United States opponent. Tougher, more resilient, and more motivated. With the victory of the United States of America in the war, which gave birth to the American empire, or the Yankee empire, or the New England empire, a cancer which the world continues to suffer from to this very day, Washington moved to ensure that never again would the people of the, would the, people of the, of the South stand in the way of its messianic aspirations. Thus began what was known as Reconstruction, which was diplomatic parlance for cultural genocide. Insidious and overt means were employed against the South, and still are to this day, by the US federal government to dilute and eradicate the cultural identity of Dixie, including plundering the wealth of the Southern states, introducing big business, also known as corporate capitalism or oligarchic capitalism to towns and cities across the South and implementing bureaucracy on a massive level in the Southern states. Essentially, the US federal government sought to pollute the souls and destroy the minds of Southerners and eventually turn them into shells or zombies. The imposition on the South by the US federal government of its values and culture, I use the words values and culture in a very loose way, continues unabated to the present day. Today, the Southern states are plagued by enormous levels of crime, something which was unheard of both before and indeed during the war of 1861 to 1865. And also today, a substantial percentage of the population of the South has lost its cultural identity, which explains why the malevolent actions of the US federal government in the Southern states meets little to no meaningful resistance, such as the emphatic success of Washington's practice of cultural genocide. In so many words, the South has become, to a great extent, impotent. In more recent years, the US federal government has settled vast numbers of immigrants in the southern states so as to change the racial, demo racial demographics there, whereby southerners will one day be a minority on their own soil. A practice, I should add, that the British ruling elite, of which the monarchy and aristocracy is at the heart of, is employing in Britain today against the British people with the same objective. Lest us forget that the American and the British ruling elites comprise the Western ruling elites or the globalists. 
Returning to America, it must be told that, unsurprisingly, the US federal government is not settling immigrants in New England. The US federal government will not allow its heart, New England, and its New England cultural identity to be touched. Together with settling immigrants in the southern states, people who have zero in common with the cultural and spiritual values of southerners, and zero in common with the heritage of southerners, the US federal government, over the course of the last 25 years or so, and especially in the last few years, has removed Confederate monuments and other vestiges of the old Confederacy. I believe that, in due course, the federal government will eradicate Confederate graves, ban the display in public and in private of Confederate symbols, such as the Confederate battle flag, and make it illegal to publicly and privately express support for the Confederacy. Through Hollywood, mainstream media, so-called NGOs and so-called human rights groups, the US federal government depicts Southerners as backward, uneducated, stupid, barely literate, dull, lazy, dirty, far-right, white supremacists and neo-Nazis. And as people who are abnormal because they are church-going and God fearing. In essence, the US federal government is telling the rest of America and the rest of the world that Southerners are a deviation and thereby not true Americans, which, when read between the lines, means Southerners should have no place in America. The US federal government portrays Southerners as at best, semi-human, and at worst, as subhuman. Because, as I said earlier on, Washington fears Southerners, because Southerners, by which I mean unreconstructed Southerners, stand in the way of the agenda of the US federal government. Wherever in the world you find the Western ruling elites, you find cancer. The American and the British ruling elites, who, as I have said, form the Western ruling elites or the globalists, perpetrate cultural genocide in order to turn people into mindless and soulless slaves, so that their so-called heaven on earth, which in reality is hell on earth, can be achieved. The Western ruling elites are perpetrating cultural genocide in many countries today. From America, to Canada, to Britain, to France, to Germany, to Italy, to Serbia, to Australia, to name but a few. But it is in Dixie where the American ruling elite first tested and perfected the practice of cultural genocide. From Dixie, the American ruling elite, together with the British ruling elite, have carried out that diabolical practice, and I use the word diabolical in a strict biblical sense, in all four corners of the world. I urge people to learn the complete history of the US federal government's practice of cultural genocide. And to accomplish this, People must learn about the calamity which struck the southern states in 1861 and has been striking the south ever since. To understand what is happening today in the western world, one must start in Dixie. Thank you very much.